Hello, everyone, and welcome back to season two of the Mayo Lab podcast. I'm Alexis Lee, and as always, joined with Megan Rosenthal. Hi, everybody. And we are so excited to have Dr. Erica Montgomery in the studio today, a UM professor and family member of, you know, this community. So we're so excited. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm excited to dive into the topic of depression and stigma around depression today. But before we get there, Dr. Montgomery, will you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you got to UM? Absolutely. Um, I was saying before we got started, this is probably the hardest question that I had to contemplate for this <laughs> meeting. So. I'm a mom. That's one of my favorite roles, personally. Mm -hmm. I have an eight-year-old son, married to my best friend, and I like to read and write, and I really like to meditate. So Mm -hmm. that's me in a nutshell, personally. Um, Professionally, I've been a counselor since 2011, and I started working with families and their children, doing play therapy, working in, you know, different capacities, and then A few years into my career, I went into hypnotherapy because I started doing Mm -hmm. my own deep healing work. So that really interested me as a way to heal on a deeper level with my clients. And so got some training in that, got some training in trauma-focused CBT, and started working with adults, children, and families with Mm -hmm. trauma. I've kind of been a little bit of everywhere. Mm -hmm. And most recently, I completed my PhD in counselor education. I finished that in November of 22, and my dissertation Mm. work was actually using mindfulness-based stress reduction to reduce aggression in adolescent girls. Wow. So that was probably the highlight of my PhD, was getting to work with that community, getting to work with those girls. We did the um, the intervention groups in Plannersville, Mississippi. I don't Mm. know if y'all know where that is. Mm -hmm. It's a little south of Tupelo. They were wonderful, and their faculty and staff really, they were committed to improving the mental health of their kids. And so that Mm -hmm. was a really important involvement for me. Mm -hmm. So very thankful that I got the opportunity to do that with them. But currently, I am working for the University of Mississippi, like Mm -hmm. you mentioned. I am clinic director of our COPE clinic. COPE is the Clinic for Outreach and Personal Enrichment. And it's the counselor education training clinic where all of our interns come to do their practicum and internship work. Mm -hmm. So uh, we offer free in-person and telehealth mental health services to anybody across the state. Another important resource for us just to be able to give back. And I also do youth mental health first aid training. So that's something that we had talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite projects that I have right now is just being able to teach people how to work with youth who are having mental health challenges. That is incredible. And I am so excited to dive into the breadth of things that you've been involved in in your career so far. (laughs) I think that's very cool. And also, side note, congratulations on finishing your PhD. That is a huge deal as somebody who's done it and then somebody who's about to do it very shortly. (laughs) um, That's a a huge accomplishment. And and what an amazing project to be working with a a Mm -hmm. group of young women Mm -hmm. and getting them to a better place and, and figuring out what it looks like so that we can ultimately scale that knowledge and expertise Mm -hmm. across a broader group of human beings on the planet. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's one of the most fun pieces of doing research, right, is like you're answering questions, but then you're also figuring out, okay, how do we help everyone else who I might not be able to have hands on in the beginning get Mm -hmm. benefit from from this new knowledge? Thinking through kind of the topic of of discussion today and what Alexis, you know, mentioned at the beginning, we're talking about depression and kind of what that is and how that manifests itself in our families and our friends and and peer groups and all of that. But because we're thinking through this on kind of an educational level today, can you just give us a little bit of a definition of, from a clinical perspective, what depression is? And then maybe we can go into how it might manifest itself in different groups of people. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So I think the misconception about depression is that it's just sadness, but it's so much more than sadness. It's this pervasive, persistent, low mood that really impacts every area of a person's life. Mm -hmm. So ways that that can show up may be low energy, maybe sleep disturbances, really um, losing interest in things that you used to enjoy, just that that lack of enjoyment of life, that lack of zest that somebody maybe once had. So it, it's just a lot more than I think we conceptualize. It can even impact appetite and concentration. Mm-hmm. So if a person in your life or you, if you're experiencing depressed mood or depression in a clinical sense, it can really affect all the areas of your life at once, which makes it that much more difficult to get a handle on. Mm-hmm. 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 And is there any, you know, because I think what, you, what you're what you saying about depression being a lot of different things, not just being in a bad mood or feeling mm-hmm. sad, how, is there any differences in how it shows up in young people versus adults or young 
children, because unfortunately we have a growing population sure. of young children who are experiencing depression, our adolescent population mm-hmm. and adults. Is there differences in terms of what you'd look for across those groups? There can be, yes. Because oftentimes in children, it shows up as acting out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They just don't have the verbal capacity to be, to be able to tell us that I feel sad and I don't know why, mm-hmm. or I felt hopeless for several days in a row. They don't have that language. Mm-hmm. So there's maybe more behavioral Mm-hmm. And then adolescence is always a time that kind of unstable mm-hmm. in our development. <laughs> that's, I think that's the word I'll use, unstable. <laughs> because everything is just in flux. Everything's right. changing for us at that time. Mm-hmm. So it could look like withdrawal from their friends mm-hmm. or, you know, if they once loved a sport, then they decide to quit the team. Mm-hmm. So it can look like withdrawal from things and people that they loved at one time. Mm-hmm. And then in adults, you know, we have a different level of responsibility in our lives. Mm-hmm. We have mm-hmm. things like, I need to go to work. I need to pay the bills. Mm-hmm. I have family. Mm-hmm. So ours may be more subtle, mm-hmm. but it can still show up in things like depression, or lack mm-hmm. of concentration, mm-hmm. depression, I mean, low mood, mm-hmm. lack of sleep, lack of appetite. Mm-hmm. They're, they're just more subtle ways that it may show up in adults. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you differentiate between maybe like a few days of just being, you know, something's sad. happened? Yeah, and you're sure. sad or maybe you are trying to get over, maybe it's been a bad meal and you just don't realize like that it's maybe not the flu or food poisoning, but you just don't, you know, what Mm -hmm. is the line or how do you walk that to say, maybe I'm just having a bad week or a bad day Mm -hmm. versus maybe it's a month, I guess. Maybe I'm answering my own question. (laughs) (laughs) But I definitely think that the frequency and the duration of the symptoms tells us a lot about what's going on. But Depression is much more than just environmental or situational. There's biological and psychological factors as well. Mm -hmm. So it could be a low mood that you can't shake for a long time, like you said. It could be something that's brought on by the loss of a loved one and like grief and Mm -hmm. depression with Mm -hmm. grief. So it can come on and stay on for, you know, Mm -hmm. different amounts of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I think that one of the other things that, that kind of strikes me around this topic and and in our overall theme for the season two of the podcast this time around related to stigma. And I Mm. wondered if we could get, you know, kind of get your thoughts on stigma related to depression in particular, but mental health in general, as as you have viewed it uh, as a as a clinician and provider in Mm. that space. Mm -hmm. Honestly, stigma is one of the biggest barriers to treatment Mm -hmm. that I've come up against with Mm -hmm. my clients. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much shame around mental health challenges. There's not only the mental health challenge you're dealing with, but when you go to someone in your community and they tell you, well, you just need to pray about it harder, Mm -hmm. or why don't you cheer up, or try thinking about something else. There's Mm -hmm. this internalized shame that maybe I've done something wrong to cause this, or maybe there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And so when we have that stigma of it's a character defect to be depressed or to Mm -hmm. be anxious Mm -hmm. or whatever mental health Mm -hmm. challenge you're going through, then it becomes this shameful experience. Mm-hmm. And really that keeps people people from reaching out for help. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what are some of the ways in which you work through? So, because, I mean, there we've what we've learned so far this season that there are stigma affects different levels and different kinds of ways, right? Mm-hmm. From the individual to the family to the community. But when you're working with that individual who is finally found some way to get the courage up to come and ask for help? And how do you work through that that internalized shame that they might have, that they have done something wrong or that they have a character defect, as you said, to get them to a place where they can be accepting of, of the help that you could be, be providing to them? Right. Well, that's, that's a great question. I think uh, just the act of reaching out, of realizing that this is something bigger than I can handle mm-hmm. is already a step towards healing that shame mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and being that person that can sit there non-judgmentally with them and just sit in that space and hold that space for them really goes a long way to healing that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much judgment outside of that relationship in therapy that we get the privilege of holding that time with them mm-hmm. so that they have that place where they don't have to face that judgment. Mm-hmm. What does because we talk we hear a lot about this in kind of the wellness community and the self help space you know holding space mm-hmm. being non judgmental what does that mean in practice because we get into the weeds on this podcast like so what does that <laughs> actually look like in practice right because it's one thing I'm non judgmental mm-hmm. okay but what does that mean mm-hmm. right right so. First off, as counselors, we have to be aware of what our values are, Mm -hmm. of what that looks like when we go into a space with somebody. 
what do I think about depression? What mm-hmm. do I think about positive psychology and self-help and, and the tools that are available out there? Getting really self-aware with what it means for you to deal with that topic mm-hmm. so that you ethically can show up with that person. Mm-hmm. And if you have those judgments come up, because we're just humans, mm-hmm. you know, a counselor is just as human as the next person. So we're going to have thoughts and feelings about the things that come into our space. But we have to learn to set that aside Mm -hmm. and to say, this is not about me. This time is not for me. Mm -hmm. This is for the person across from me. So Mm -hmm. just I think the first step is being self-aware of what actually comes up for me during this time with this person. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think that's a really good point and something I think that other folks can be thinking about. What are your values? What does that look Mm -hmm. like? Um, But you mentioned a a term or a phrase or a field of research. I want to just pause on for a second. What is positive psychology? Can you give us a little overview of that? So for those of the folks who are listening, you might not know that term. Sure. Um, So positive psychology really has kind of come into its own in the mainstream media, with Mm -hmm. social media, with Mm -hmm. people on TikTok, YouTube, wherever you Mm -hmm. make your videos, talking about just ways to help yourself to stay positive, to reframe thoughts in a positive way. Gratitude plays a big role in Mm -hmm. positive psychology. And And that's not my area of expertise by any means. So my very shallow understanding of it. It's just that reframe mm-hmm. of how we're looking mm-hmm. at, at things through a more positive lens. Mm-hmm. 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 Very cool. That's, that's what I got. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. I mean, I, uh, yeah, that's how I would have described it. And I'm not an expert in your field either. So that one. <laughs> <laughs> I did all right. <laughs> um, shifting a little to, for as a counselor and then the individual having those one-on-ones mm-hmm. to being maybe a family member or a friend. Mm-hmm. Maybe the person who's suffering with depression can't afford or doesn't have access to counseling and those resources. When they come to friends or family, what's a way that they can kind of, other than what you've named, set aside that judgment mm-hmm. in a way and just be available for them, mm-hmm. but also not step in as and try and act as a counselor? I think that's an important piece is that we don't try to Well, counselors don't give advice, but even if someone that you love comes to you or your friend comes to you and says, hey, I'm really depressed, Mm -hmm. I'm not able to do things like I used to, and and they're really struggling, you see that, try not to give advice. That that would be the first thing is just listen Mm -hmm. and just be there. It can be difficult to watch someone that we love go through something hard that we can't fix for them. Mm -hmm. So our natural inclination is to jump in and try to solve and rescue and fix the problem. But what's most helpful is just to be, just to Mm -hmm. exist with them. Mm -hmm. So if that means just going to their house and sitting with them on the couch while they lay there and watch TV, that's what we do, just to be in that same space and and love them in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking through, so we've kind of broadened out from that kind of individual one-on-one interaction with, with a counselor to kind of what do families how can families exist and be with that person in the moment that they might not be in a good place? But let's bring this back to the stigma piece of this. So in mm-hmm. your work, because you've worked with individuals and you've mm-hmm. worked with families as well, what are the kinds of stigmas that you witness in your interactions with families as it relates to depression or mental health issues or any of those kinds of things? One of the things that comes up with parents a lot of the times in in family therapy is that the parents feel responsible if their child is depressed, Mm -hmm. like I did something wrong. And so there can be this sense of shame within the family system as well, of the parents taking responsibility for how the child is feeling and Mm -hmm. saying, well, you know, in my family, we don't feel this way. We don't get depressed in this family and really Mm -hmm. taking ownership of that that doesn't belong to them. They make it mean something about them and their parenting. Mm-hmm. They make it mean something about whether or not they did a good job as a parent. And that's really not the case. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be the best parent that there ever has been, and you can be loving and supportive, and your child can still struggle. Mm-hmm. 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 I think that is a really brilliant observation, because in the time that Alexis and I have been in this space and, and talking with families and parents uh, around these kinds of issues, that internalization that parents bring mm-hmm. to the table, because mm-hmm. nobody has a child with the intention of being that that kid is going to have mm-hmm. struggles, right? right. Like we, that's not what we do, right? right. And, and we and we have, and I, I believe that comes from a, a sincere place of just wanting the best mm-hmm. for them. And so, if you were to, and in your in your conversations with parents who are kind of working through that, and you're, you know, kind of maybe mental how I would think about it is like, it's not about you, it's about them. But how do you get parents to that without? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm 
skipping over the fact that those feelings are real and the, the right. come from a good place too, right? right? So it's it, you have a really complicated job, but how do you, how do, you do that? <laughs> I, I do think it's a dance, but recognizing that that's where that parent is coming from, that mm-hmm. they want the best for their child and really validating that feeling of this was not what you wanted for your kid. And there's this mm-hmm. powerlessness that I can't fix this, that mm-hmm. I can't make it okay. And so just validating those feelings, Mm -hmm. recognizing where it comes from for them, and Mm -hmm. that it's really difficult to watch your child struggle. I think that's the first step in being able to reconcile some of that is Mm -hmm. just recognizing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you mentioned the the idea or the program that you're involved in with Mental Health First Aid Training for Youth, can you walk us through a little bit about what that is and why it's something that you have obviously a great deal of passion for and interest in the breadth of work that you're engaged Mm -hmm. in? Sure. I really do love youth mental health first aid. It's one of my favorite things that I get to do. Mm -hmm. I always say that my job doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) this is one of the things that I have the most fun with is Mm -hmm. being able to teach people how to help kids who Mm -hmm. are dealing with mental health challenges, right? So we, so far we have worked with school districts. We've worked with secondary education students, with UMC down in Jackson. I've worked with different teachers, administrators, coaches. Mm -hmm to offer this training just to give the adults in these children's lives some tools, some Mm -hmm. resources Mm -hmm. of when you see this, when you see these behavior changes and you notice they're not eating lunch with their friends or you notice that they cry after class, Mm -hmm. what can you do to intervene? Mm -hmm. How can you get them connected to resources? Mm -hmm. So what we talk about is a five-step action plan that just gives them the tools that they need Mm -hmm. to step-by-step assess what's going on Mm -hmm. and be able to give those encouraging resources, information, and be able to be a good listener because Mm -hmm. we're we're not taught listening skills, really. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to have those listening skills in your back pocket to be Mm -hmm. able to Mm -hmm. be there and ask those open-ended questions Mm -hmm. just to support and Mm -hmm. not to give advice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And because we're in the weeds again, can you walk us through what those five (laughs) steps look like without giving the farm away, right? Because well, if sure. you have access to mental health first aid training for youth, you yes. should absolutely, absolutely go and take advantage yes. of it. But like, let's do a little teaser so we can get folks for interested sure. and, and sure. signed up. And for people who are interested in it, we have a grant right now. So we're doing it for free through awesome. Counselor Education. Fantastic. Yes. So, um, if that's something that you're interested in or any listeners are interested in, then, you know, there are resources available to mm-hmm. get it for free. Mm. So, Like I said, there's a five-step action plan that's all revolving around assessment. And each step you want to assess and be sure that there's no risk of harm to the child or the people around you, Mm -hmm. uh, that it's not a crisis situation Mm -hmm. where we're not looking at something like um, an overdose or suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. So we want to constantly assess for that crisis Mm -hmm. and that risk. And then just learning how to approach the child. What do I say even, Mm -hmm, you know, mm because you're working with, like we said, teenagers earlier. There's a lot of instability for their relationships and their Mm self-concept. So we want to learn those skills of how do I even begin to approach Mm -hmm. this person? How do I start a conversation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then from there, just learning those listening skills and what resources are available. and How Mm -hmm. do I get them connected to that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, that's the Yeah, no, that's perfect. No, thank you. No, and I think I want to circle back to what you said to you about listening skills, right? Because I think that my dad used to say this to me all the time. There's a difference between listening to wait for your turn to talk and listening Mm -hmm. to listen to what the person is saying. And Mm -hmm. so from your perspective and and your area of expertise, what are listening skills and how do we practice those? Well, your dad was absolutely right. (laughs) For one, good job, dad, because there's a difference in listening to respond and Mm -hmm. listening to understand. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we're sitting with someone and we really want to hear what they're saying, we want to listen to understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Part of that includes putting those judgments down putting down that what I think about this Mm -hmm. and really hearing where they're coming from and what their experience is. Mm -hmm. I want to listen to you to understand Mm -hmm. you and to understand your worldview. Mm -hmm. So listening to understand Mm -hmm. is one. You know, good eye contact. Be sure I'm I'm attending. Mm -hmm. Be sure I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Don't have your phone out. Don't, you know, if somebody's talking to you and you're on your phone, that really leads them to believe that you're not engaged, that you don't care. And Um, You could just be holding your phone. You don't even have to be on it. Mm -hmm. So people are much more likely to approach you and to tell you about their experience Mm -hmm. in a candid way if Mm -hmm. you are really attending with Mm -hmm. your body. Mm -hmm. Um, So attending with your body, attending with your face, your Mm -hmm. eyes, your ears, have everything turned on and tuned on. Right, Mm -hmm. right. 
Well, I love this idea of thinking through the distraction piece, right? Because it's how often do you like walk without your phone somewhere or do that? That's like such a normal part of our existence It's an now. extension of my hand. Right, yeah. right, right. And there was, I, there was something I read last week was talking about how like there's this new uh, syndrome. I'm putting that in air quotes for those of you who are listening. There's talking about like you, the panic people feel when they don't have their phone like mm. physically next to them mm-hmm. and, and the, that not being connected for for a time. But I think your, your points are all, t- mm-hmm. like – totally valid and completely well taken to think through how do you attend not just with your ears but with your whole existence mm-hmm. right and thinking mm-hmm. about putting those items down and engaging in that and and when I work with students on I'm a qualitative interviewer by training so part of that is to get people to tell you their secrets right that's the job <laughs> of qualitative <laughs> interviews and so it's like thinking through not being distracted attending with your body as you're mm-hmm. saying putting those things mm-hmm. away because if you think about it from the other side of the table do you feel listened to when the person who's supposed to be listening to you is holding their phone or right. scratching notes or not t- not looking, looking at, at you? you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a completely normal thing when you flip it mm-hmm. around to be like, well, no, of course they're not listening. Right. But it's a really hard thing to remember to do <laughs> yeah. when you were the, the person who's supposed yeah. to be listening, right? It's like that golden rule: treat others how you want to be treated. Yes. yes. In all facets. It yes. is. But. It is. No, it's so funny how that, like, yeah. like th- those fundamentals keep coming back. Like, yeah, that golden mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there, there's a reason mm-hmm. that has been around for us so yeah. long. No, that's awesome. I love that. And I, so I'd like to switch gears. So we talked, you know, about individuals. We've talked about kind of family units and friend units and kind of people within your your inner circle. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about communities now. What does depression-related stigma or mental health-related stigma, what impact do you see that that has on our communities on a larger scale? Sure. Well, for one, I think that the the stigma, the shame around mental health challenges is really perpetuated and reinforced in our communities, Mm -hmm. particularly in the South. I'm not sure if it's a Southern thing or if it's, um, if that's just my perspective, Mm -hmm. because that's where I am. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that there's always this, we're going to keep that quiet Mm -hmm. mentality. Mm -hmm. And so the more that our communities can learn about what these symptoms really look like and the, the range and severity of these symptoms and how we can help, I think we're going to see more healing in our communities on a larger scale, Mm -hmm. in a bigger Mm -hmm. sense. And circling back a little bit to depression, this idea, depression, I'm assuming, but does depression exist in a silo? Or is it a side effect of other maybe mental illnesses or struggles? Or can other mental illnesses and struggles be a side effect of depression? All of the above. Yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Depression can be... It can be standalone. Mm-hmm. You may not have any other co-occurring disorders with it, mm-hmm. or it could be part of another set of issues. Mm-hmm. Certainly, it can be part of other issues like bipolar disorder because there's the the ups and downs, mm-hmm. the highs and lows with that. But it also is seen pretty frequently with anxiety as a co-occurring, co-occurring disorder. And I think that that's a real struggle, a real challenge to balance both of those things. Mm-hmm. I've seen that a, a lot with my clients is that Um, They feel anxious, but they're too depressed to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Or they feel depressed, but they're scared to reach out for help because they have both of these things happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, depression can be by itself, Mm -hmm. but often we see it with other things, Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly when there's been a major life change, Mm -hmm. adjustment issues, like I said earlier, grief. Mm -hmm. There are environmental factors that can contribute to that as well. So. Mm -hmm. It can definitely be with yeah. other issues. How long, in a way, and I'll phrase this, like my counselor at one point had me do like a, a scheduling thing. It was like, look back in your calendar six weeks ago and kind of see what happened mm-hmm. has happened. And mm-hmm. then what is causing some of the issues and struggles I'm having now? Is mm-hmm. there like a time frame that maybe if a environmental change has happened, a move, a grief, that maybe the pent up energy can take longer to show than yeah. rather than be right away. Mm. Well, sure. With adjustment disorders, what you're usually looking for is something that is acute, so six months or less. And then something more chronic would be a different diagnosis. It might be something like major depressive disorder. So if we're looking back six weeks, then that can absolutely be an adjustment. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think it's important, too, you bring up an important part of this is knowing what happened just before the change occurred in your mood, right? Right. Looking at what are some of those environmental factors that are happening for me around the time that I noticed that I stopped wanting to go out with my friends Mm -hmm. or that I stopped wanting to get up and go to work or Mm -hmm. wear necklaces. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. 
<laughs> I just started wearing necklaces again post pandemic. Mm. Realized I was not. Uh, yeah, the pandemic taking advantage <laughs> of all of my fabulous clothes. Right, the pandemic conversation Shop. will probably be it. It's a whole other. Yeah, that's a whole other season. Oh my gosh! Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I actually just read this morning. I wrote it down. An article from Berkeley that well, reported depression rates mm-hmm. since COVID have tripled in the U.S. Wow. wow. Yeah. I was wow. really floored by that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's what's reported. And we know that so much goes unreported mm-hmm. because of things like stigma. Mm-hmm. That people are just afraid to reach out for help. Earlier, I mentioned that adults, they have all these responsibilities. And so it may look different, more subtle. But that could also be because people are afraid they're going to lose their jobs. Mm-hmm. They're going to lose their kids. Mm-hmm. Because we still do have this thought that it's a character defect to be depressed. Right, right. So, um, yeah, COVID, uh, yeah, that's a whole conversation. (laughs) That is a whole conversation. conversation. But I think your your statistic there saying that that the rates of reported depression have tripled since the pandemic is such an important observation because I think that we have this weird balance when we're talking about mental health issues, things like depression, anxiety, et cetera, because we have this idea that the stigma has prevented some people from mm-hmm. getting the mm-hmm. care that they need. But we're also mm-hmm. seeing that this like skyrocketing in number of reported cases and number yeah. of instances. So on one side, it kind of gives me a little bit of hope because at mm-hmm. least maybe those cases already existed and folks are getting yeah. help yeah. now and yeah. we didn't know, mm-hmm. right? So there's like a shift yeah. in the conversation that's taken place since the pandemic that minimally, maybe, we can go and seek out Mm -hmm. some assistance. Yes. And and we've made it so much more accessible now Right, um, with telehealth. Telehealth has become much more accessible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's the word. Mm -hmm. And and so even at the clinic at COPE, Mm -hmm. we implemented telehealth as a kind of a response to COVID. Mm -hmm. And we continued it to this day. And it has been just a tremendous tool in being able to help people across the state who may not be able to get to a counselor. Right. Like you said, they may not mm-hmm. have the resources, the money, the transportation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so just being able to meet them where they are, mm-hmm. to tell them that, you know, you don't have to come to my office on my turf. Right. I can meet you on your couch. Right. Mm-hmm. It's right. been so helpful in getting people the help that they need in various settings. So yeah. it's been great. Yeah, yeah. And I think that coming back to this conversation around, you know, what it, what it, you you mentioned earlier about kind of the how we think about and talk about mental health in the South being potentially a barrier mm-hmm. to to seeking out treatment. And I think one of the things that I have noted in the time that I've been in this space is that despite what we maybe say publicly, everyone, everyone, whether it's you, your close family, a friend, uh, somebody else in your community, we all know somebody who's suffering with mm-hmm. this, right? Know somebody who, who who is suffering with substance use disorder mm-hmm. or a mental health concern or some combination thereof. What are some, from your perspective and the work that you've done in this space, things that we can think about doing to kind of like throw back the veil on that? Because mm-hmm. we know it's there. We're just yeah. not talking about it, right? So how do we start talking about it in a way that like demystifies it and destigmifies? Ties it. Mm. Right, right. I think, well, just talking about it in general, it's mm-hmm. not something we sweep under the rug. It's something, you know, people still whisper, she goes to therapy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we don't need to whisper about our counselors. And, right. and I've noticed that this younger generation coming up, they will shout it from the rooftops. Mm-hmm. I go to therapy on Tuesdays at two o'clock and they are proud of it. Right. And so I think that our, our younger people are really leading the cause on that, of just being vocal about Mm -hmm. it, talking about it, saying Mm -hmm. there are resources available if you are suffering. You don't have to struggle alone. But as far as how to talk about it, that is a really good question. I think that's something that we're all trying to figure out together Mm -hmm. right now Mm -hmm. is how do we openly talk about these issues, Mm -hmm. letting people know that it is okay to be in that place. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. and we're seeing a lot more of that now. Mm -hmm. It's okay to not be okay. Right. Um, it's okay to ask for help, mm-hmm. those types of sentiments. So we're seeing more of that, just being open about what's going on and accepting that people are going to struggle. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I think we come across as a society is that we're not comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So getting more comfortable with that discomfort it would be a huge step in the right direction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I actually <laughs> really love that, right? Because, I mean— 
it's part of the human condition, right? Yeah. If we're all human beings yeah. and we I hope are, we are. We're, yeah. <laughs> right? And we're going through this life and we're going through these things and things are going to go bad sometimes mm-hmm. and things are going to go well sometimes. And when they go bad, you're going to have bad feelings about it. And sometimes those get out of control and they're right. not through any fault of your own. It could be other chemistry, mm-hmm. physiological, mm-hmm. whatever else is going on. But that's normal. It is. It's totally normal normal. to be in a funk. It's totally normal Mm -hmm. to be angry. It's totally normal to have all of those different kinds of feelings that we kind of like try to put in a box and ignore. It would be abnormal to Mm -hmm. be perfectly fine after (laughs) your dog dies. Like that would be abnormal. Right. (laughs) right. It was a normal response to (laughs) an abnormal condition, an abnormal situation. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I listened to a podcast yesterday and they were saying, you know, one of the things that she loves to tell people is, you are not alone. Yeah. You are not the first person to ever think this thought. You will, and you, <laughs> you won't, won't be the be last. The last right? And you aren't the first or and you won't be the last to feel the way you felt. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, us as humans, we like really want to be special and unique. <laughs> we all do. I mean, it's true. <laughs> but the reality is, it's like we're all not. We're not. We all, you know, everyone's feeling this. Mm-hmm. Everyone right. is struggling in some way. Maybe it manifests differently, mm-hmm. looks different, is caused by different things, but like. Yeah. I mean, I have a reality that someone else in my friend group is or family is struggling right now. The same things mm-hmm. I'm struggling in. Like, that's just the reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I read something recently. and I can't remember where. Probably on social media somewhere. But it was, uh, <laughs> we're all in the same storm. We're not all in the same boat. And so while know. we do have the same experiences, we may not all have the same access to resources right. to deal with those experiences. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's an important factor as well, is just right. being sure that those resources are accessible mm-hmm. no matter where you are in life. Yeah. But it is the same storm. We mm-hmm. are going through it together. So it's important to know you're not alone. Mm-hmm. 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 I think I love that that idea of making sure those resources are ac- accessible yeah. to his, a, a, everyone, as right? Everybody. Because that is, that is the goal, right, mm-hmm. is, to, is to make sure that everybody can get you know, to a better place and to, mm-hmm. to whatever wellness looks like, happiness, health, whatever it looks like for them. For them. Yeah. Is there something you thought we would talk about today, but we have yet to talk about today that you, because I see you have notes, so I, I want to make sure notes. to honor the fact that you did the note t- <laughs> writing in anticipation of this conversation today. One of the things that we didn't talk about that I think is interesting is what are we doing to make it worse? Oh, yeah. And so one of my notes on that is yeah. misinformation, especially on social media. Oh, very good, very um, good. That's, very, a whole, oh, that's, a, <laughs> that, that's a whole podcast by I, itself. I will say this, and I'm, I'm really sorry my parents were here this weekend, and my mom said something about, oh, I read something or about, about this as being true. And I said, where'd you hear that? She said, oh, it was on social media. And I said, yeah, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> <laughs> circle back to that. Um, but I think that's one of the most damaging things that we can do is, is put it out there saying this food is going to cure your depression or mm-hmm. this breathing exercise is going to cure your anxiety. Really, my advice for that would be do your own research. Talk to mm-hmm. a doctor. Talk to a counselor. Mm-hmm. Don't believe everything you hear on social media because they're probably putting it out there for clicks and likes. And so it's not always, sometimes it is, yeah. sometimes it is, but it's not always sound advice mm-hmm. for what you're going through. Mm-hmm. And it's not specific to you right. because the way that it looks for me may look different from the way it looks, yeah. the way right. it looks for you. Right. So um, just being sure to be aware of that. Mm. I think mm. your I think your comment about it being for likes or clicks or increasingly in a lot of different spaces for money, right? Yeah. They're selling yeah. whatever yes. thing it is that they've got. Their on. program that they developed. Right, right. And so being <laughs> cognizant of the of that and maybe the program would really work for you, but not diving in headlong before mm-hmm. you do a little of your own due diligence, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Additional research, mm-hmm. talking to experts in this space, availing yourself of the variety of different resources that are available for free online, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. you, there's lots of really amazing resources that are available and we'll link some of those below the episode for this week so you all can mm-hmm. have those, you know, saved in your bookmark space for anybody who still does that. But I think that's really important thing to recognize, right? Mm-hmm. Some things will work for some folks, some things will yeah. not work for some mm-hmm. folks. But if you're lining somebody else's pockets to your own detriment, I mean, that's not right, that's right. not helping anybody, right? right? Mm-hmm. You want to be sure that it's going to be healthy for you. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Not absolutely. to say you can't use those resources. If you find a, a meditation yeah. on YouTube and it works for you, good, awesome. yeah. do mm-hmm. it. But be sure that you're vetting your sources. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. 
No, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And that is, I love that because that is one of the goals of the podcast is to make sure that we're getting yeah. out those resources to folks that are, you know, that are, have been vetted, that have been mm-hmm. recognized as being, you know, based in data, based in mm-hmm. evidence, all of those mm-hmm. different kinds of things. Well, I love that. And thank you for bringing us back to kind of what could be making it worse, mm-hmm. um, because I think that's also a really important conversation to have. I think right now, and and for those of you who have been listening so far this season, you already remember this. So the thing we like to close with are what are what is the challenge we're going to leave our listeners with this week? What are mm-hmm. some things that they can do for themselves, for their families, and for our communities right. to to be working to building out a better, healthier existence for all of us? Sure. So one of the things I like to do with my clients is ask them these open-ended questions that really get them to dig into mm-hmm. what their values are. Mm-hmm. What are your beliefs? So my challenge would be to think about what do you think about depression? Mm-hmm. What are your ideas and, mm-hmm. and your values around that? And what are the messages you've gotten from your family and your mm-hmm. community at large about what that might mean. Mm-hmm. So how do you push back against that? How do you challenge what you've been taught and what's been ingrained in you about depression? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I love that. I love yeah. that. Because I think we don't, we take so much of that thinking for granted mm-hmm. yeah. because we're in that existence and mm-hmm. we're in our communities mm-hmm. and we're in our families right. all the time. So it's hard to st- take that step back and really have a bird's eye view yeah. of what right. that ends up looking like. Think about like. what you're thinking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about for families? For families, be patient. That would be, I think, the biggest thing. The, mm-hmm. the first step is be patient. If you have someone in your family that's struggling, we know that you want it to get better. We know that it comes from a place of love, but be patient with them and be present with them. Mm-hmm. And communities. And communities. Let's start talking about it. Let's have oh, these yeah. big, hard yeah. conversations and make those resources available. And and if you know that there's a community event that's happening, let's get out there, be a part of it, mm. and just show up for each other. Awesome. Mm. All sound pieces of advice and things that everyone can do like now. Yeah. <laughs> so um, get cracking and let us know how it goes <laughs> in our comments and our social media feeds. Thank you, Dr. Montgomery, for, for making you. the time to be here with us today. We appreciate your time and your expertise mm. and What a lovely conversation that we've had this morning. I just appreciate the opportunity to be here and to help people learn a little bit about it, demystify it like we talked about. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. And tune in to our next episode of the Mayo Lab podcast. Have a good day. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Mayo Lab podcast. The Mayo Lab podcast is produced by Dr. Natasha Jeter, Dr. Megan Rosenthal, Alexis Lee, Slade Lewis, and Hannah Finch. This podcast was recorded at Broadcast Studio in Oxford, Mississippi. The show was mixed and mastered by Clay Jones, and our original music was composed by Slade Lewis. The Mayo Lab podcast is brought to you by the William McGee Institute for Student Wellbeing. For more information on the Mayo Lab podcast, head over to themayolab.com and follow us on social media at the Mayo Lab. If you enjoyed listening to the Mayo Lab podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this podcast. This podcast represents the opinions of Dr. Megan Rosenthal, Alexis Lee, and their guests on the show. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for the medical advice of a licensed counselor or physician. The listener should consult with their mental health professional in any matters related to his or her health or the health of a child. Thank you.